Robert Steele and Scott Struzanti uh, joining me. Uh, both of them are actually in Texas, even though uh, Scott hails from the great city of Chicago. Why don't we say hello? Hey, Robert, how are you doing? What are you drinking today? How are you? Uh, it's an exciting drink here. It's uh, Diet Coke. <laughs> There we go. Uh, at least you're avoiding the uh, the sugar. In New York City, you know, we're banning we're banning drinks over 20 ounces in New York City. So I'm glad you have the 12 ounce version of that. Right. And Scott Strzanti from the Chicago Tribune. Hey, Scott. Hey, how's it going, Alan? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm drinking Diet Pepsi just so that there's not any kind of Diet Coke. <laughs> I'm balancing things out. I love it. So you know, what are you I, having, Alan? I'm broadcasting from Honolulu. And my favorite drink when I come home is actually these, it's, it's just green tea, unsweetened okay. green tea in a can. And the reason why I was doing it is because it's noon here in Honolulu, and I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm in Honolulu, it's the middle of the day, I, you know, I can't be drinking. And then I was like, wait a second, I'm in Honolulu in the middle of the day, <laughs> I should be drinking. So I, I had this master plan of having this artisanal beer, and I went into the <laughs> fridge, and all my 75-year-old father has is a can of Bud Light, <laughs> so that's, that's what I'll be drinking today. And How does Bud you know, Light mixed with green tea taste? Oh, boy. Oh, there you I go. I have this horrible feeling because I'm, I'm staying at my parents' home, and uh, I don't know if you guys seen seen that uh, Photoshop kind of parody video where the guy is really kind of biting and sarcastic named Donnie, and his mom is screaming at him while he's giving the Photoshop tutorial. Yeah. Well, yeah. my mom is just deaf enough hard of hearing enough that she might thinking that I'm talking to her right now. <laughs> and so my big fear is that she knocks on the door and just like, Alan, come down for lunch or something, you know. Why are you well, drinking up the, here? I might have the those girls in your room, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, let's get started. You know, we, we talked last week. We had Brad Mangin, um, who did a whole spread, multi-page spread in Sports Illustrated using Instagram. That ended up, you know, he 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 got a, a piece in Mashable, and then in Deadspin, you know, there were people who thought it was great, people who didn't think it was great. Brad thinks it's great. He used to walk around, and I remember Seal. We went out to dinner many many years ago down in Tribeca, and he carried that little Canon point and shoot wherever he went, and made some great photos. But then a year ago, when he got his iPhone, he now thinks that that's kind of God's gift to photography, and has become an avid photographer. And I know, Scott, when we talked at the Illinois Press Photographers Association, you know, you had talked about how liberating it was not to have to pull up a huge DSLR or, e or even like a Leica into someone's face. It can, it can always be the old, oh, I'm just reading my text messages, you know, far away from my face. Um, but it, it, it felt like it was freeing up your photography a lot, at least the street photography and the stuff, you know, following at Scott Struzanti on Instagram and seeing kind of the daily feed, sometimes clogging up my Instagram, but I'm not making any yeah. judgment. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but t tell us about sort of how you got into it. Yeah, well, it started mostly with my obsession with street photography, which I started doing about two years ago. And then, um, you know, so I have an outlet at the Tribune called Shooting from the Hip. It's a blog. And so I had some free time and I would just go do street photography in Chicago and, and post on the blog. But then last October, um, I took my daughter, Betsy, to Washington, D.C. for a college visit, and she had just gotten an iPhone. And I would always kind of poo-pooed the iPhone because I didn't have one and you know, thought it was overrated. And so I used hers, and I just fell in love with it immediately. I, like, I did give it back to her for three days, and I just <laughs> wandered around you know, doing you know, you know, the street phone photography, I mean the street photography with the iPhone. And then I didn't get into Instagram for maybe, uh, you know, I got my own iPhone, and then I went a couple months just doing it for my blog, and then I started doing Instagram, and oh gosh, then I like almost pushed my blog aside. Instagram became so addicting, and I just love going out there, and you know, as you, as you said, I'll probably, you know, post maybe, you know, 10 or 15 from each kind of one hour um, little photo safari I go on. And, and I, I kind of try to, like the first ones always tend to be okay, and then I want to like only post things that are better than the ones before. And so I kind of try to build on it. And uh, you know, this is a shot I just took from uh, San Antonio, um, just kind of hanging out around here. And uh, you know, for me, like you said, I, I rarely had people see me with the, you know, my big camera taking um, street photography, but now with the iPhone. 
It's just, you know, I can stand in front of someone and just take 30 pictures because it makes no noise. You know, like you said, people think I'm just looking at a text or, but most of the time I do my street photography as I'm walking past someone. So there's not really much, you know, setting up or holding it up. I just kind of love that randomness of, uh, you know, of the composition. I love the randomness of um, the exposure. I love the randomness of the processing. You know, I am to a point now where I've been shooting for 25 years. I love having no control anymore. You know, I'm tired of setting shutter speeds. I'm tired of exposing everything perfectly. I want, I just want it to be as random as possible. And, you know, if people, you know, I've seen people complain, oh, well, Instagram or Hipstamatic or whatever, you know, you don't know what you're going to get, so it's not valid somehow. But that's the point. That's what I want. I want a surprise. I want to just have, you know, some kind of, you know, it's almost like with Hipstamatic where you have that little bit of processing lag, which is maybe, you know, 15, 20 seconds. It's almost like shooting film again and going in the dark room and getting that surprise, you know, so if you don't get that instant feedback. So, you know, right. I'll shoot something and not see it for a while, and, it, and, and it's, it's exciting. You know, oh, I can't wait till this one comes up. I know this is going to be a good one, and then you look at it and you're like, ah, nope. It wasn't. <laughs> no. You know, and so, but I really, really like that. That's what I think is kind of cool about it. And, and, and going back to sort of the, the square format rather than, you know, the, the digital 4.3 format, is that liberating for you, or was it hard oh, to get used no, to that? Well, I, I, until I got an iPhone, I'd never, ever shot with anything except a 35 millimeter camera, ever. Never shot with a whole gun, never shot with medium wow. format. You know, it's just always been 35 millimeter. And so, you know, getting used to the square was, was you know, it was a little bit of a, a challenge for me. But now the rectangle looks weird. You know, like the rectangle <laughs> seems like way too much space. And like, you know, you know so it's, it's just kind of weird how you kind of go back and forth with things. Um, I, you know, when you created your blog, I assume that was one way for the photographer to have sort of direct access to his or her audience. They have the ability to comment on the blog. They have the ability to kind of see your specific entries. Instagram obviously kind of, I wouldn't say raises the bar, but it, it, it sort of advances it in that people can now follow a stream in the same way that they follow Twitter. Have you found that, you know, was, was, was customer engagement a goal of Instagramming, or was it really just an artistic outlet, and then people started seeing, hey, wow, this guy's producing some pretty good photography on the iPhone? Yeah, you know, I, I like your stream. It's definitely stream of consciousness, the Instagram, you know, it's, just, it's almost like you're watching someone's thought process. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I like feedback. I like being patted on the back. You know, I was the youngest of three kids, and I didn't get enough attention. <laughs> you, know, you know, look at this, look at this. So, you know, I think I became a photographer because I wanted to produce something, have someone praise me for it. You know, so, I, I, you know, that's what Instagram is just 100% positive. You, know, you never right. get, like, someone saying, oh, you should clean up your background or there's a pole. You know, it's like it's all, you know, hey, yay, 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 yay. You know, and I like that. I like, I like being liked and loved, you know. That, that, that's good. And uh, so I, I think that, you know, that, that it's, it's like an overall really good experience. And, um, you, know, and, I, and you know, I like, you know, also liking other people's photographs and, and things right. like that. You know, it, it's fun. You know, for me, it's, it's a two-way street. It's not just me putting stuff up there. Because I'll see some people, you know, they'll have, you know, whatever, 2,000 followers, and they'll follow six people. You know, I, I don't want that. You know, like I, for a long time, I, had, I followed more people than followed me. And I don't really know how to get followers on Instagram. It's like I don't know how, you know, I, I, you know, I guess people just kind of find you. And I think that's kind of cool, too. You know, I see, like, Richard Kochi Hernandez, who has, like, 8 million followers, and his work <laughs> so beautiful. You know, and it's all just artistic and, and just gorgeous and, you know, and he has, you know, thousands times more followers than I do, you know, and I, I don't know how he gets that many followers, but, you know, I'm a little jealous, but, you know, so, you know, if I could pick up five or ten more here, that'd be great, but, you know, it's so, you know, but, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I do, you know, I, I like sharing work. You know, I don't create work just for myself. I create it just to show other people. So, you know, and, and you know, and I, you know, usually I'm impatient. I want to share it right away. And so that's what's great about Instagram is that you're, you take a photo and then, you know, 10 seconds later, you know, someone in Korea is commenting on your photo. Which right. Is, you know. So, so what, was there any concern, speaking about sharing, was there any concern, uh, when you started Instagramming, this is your own personal device. You're taking these photos. It's going into a social media stream where copyright, eh, you know, rights grab, something's happening and you're not theoretically controlling the full thing. Was there any discussion about the Tribune, who owned the copyright, concerns about uh, photos being misappropriated? 
Yeah, it's a little bit of a slippery slope. Um, like, I was in Philadelphia, and I did a bunch of South Philly street stuff I really liked, and I'm doing stuff here. And so since I am on assignment for the Tribune, even though I'm shooting with my iPhone, I have no problem with them owning these photos because mm -hmm. the thing is, like, I'm not going to do anything with them. I'm not going to monetize them. I'm not, you know, really doing this to make money. You know, it's just kind of, you know, for me, it's just an outlet for my creativity. Um, but if I'm shooting with the iPhone on my own time, with, you know, then it's, it's uh, you know, my property. But still, I'm just creating just so many images, and I'm just creating, creating, creating. I'm not really doing anything with them. You know, maybe someday I'll try to do a book or, or, or something, but, you know, I don't know. But, you know, I'm not... I'm not too worried about, you know, really, anyone can, I don't mind if someone goes on Facebook and takes my photos and yeah. anything with them. I don't care. You know, I'm not really, you know, and it's probably, and I think it's because I have that security of a staff photo job where it's just kind of like my hobby and, you know, I'm not really trying to earn a living off of this stuff. And so, you know, it, it, it's more fun for me. Now, I think I've always kind of compared um, my iPhone to my newspaper work, kind of like if I was an artist and my iPhone work is like doodling on a napkin. You know, it's not like I'm getting out the oils and, and getting a canvas yeah. and working on something. It's just that I'm doodling, you know, and so these are my doodles, you know, and I, I, I really in, in enjoy it and it's more kind of, you know, you know, if, if anyone's ever worked at a newspaper or anything, you know that a lot of the stuff you shoot is not very rewarding or it's kind of, you know, a little bit of drudgery, and it is a job, so it's nice to have that personal outlet where I feel I have no creative boundaries. I don't have to explain to anyone what I meant or what, what was the point of this or, you know, why did you take a picture of your foot? You know, I don't care. It's just like my foot. You know, I wanted to take a picture of it. So it's, you know, so I, I, it's, it, it's, I think it's just a win-win for everyone. You know, you talk to me in Illinois a lot about establishing your brand and things like that, yeah. and I think it's, it's only a good thing. It's just like at some point... You know, I want to have my name, you know, when someone sees my name, I want them to think good photography, you know. I think that is what my, you know, kind of background goal is. And then I think, you know, Instagram is a great way to do that. It's just to, you know, get it out there. You know, it's just like it's weird. Like some, you know, this is kind of creepy, but, you know, some 15-year-old girl in Sweden just followed me the other day on, on Instagram, you know. And I kind of think, well, what, you know, I know it's not me she's following. She's following my photography. It's yeah. nothing to do with me. You know, I could be any type of person. So, but, but, you know, I just love that. I just love that I, you know, you know, 48-year-old middle-aged Midwestern man, you know, can, can create something that, that someone in a different generation finds appealing. And I, I think, you know, having that vehicle of Instagram and the iPhone to just kind of, you know, have that kind of visual communication is a wonderful thing. Uh, Robert Seal, Instagram and iPhone photography in general, gimmick or legitimate <laughs> art form? I think tool. it's great that people are excited about it. I think anything that gets people excited about photography is is wonderful. Um, but I choose not to really participate. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got enough stuff going on without, you know, messing around with, with photos I took on my iPhone. And quite frankly, I use the iPhone to, like, mark my parking space at the airport and, you know, <laughs> send, send pictures I'll be in the store and I'll shoot a label to show my wife and go, "Is this what you wanted?" And and <laughs> I mean that's that's kind of what I use it for. So I'm I'm not um, I don't know I, I just uh, have you I, have I don't you know been, why but that's just the way I am. So have you been uh, impressed by any iPhone photography where you're like, "Wow, they did that on an iPhone," or is it like, oh, "Of course, yeah, of absolutely, course, absolutely." From time to time, in fact, just some of the photos they were showing just then, and the guy in front of the Alamo, I love that and. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Trent out in Salt Lake has done great stuff with his iPhone. I actually bought one of his prints, and uh, which was hilarious. And um, you know, the stuff that Brad's doing is wonderful. David Kennerly does great stuff on it. Uh, I, Allison Smith. I get, I get you know feeds from all these people, and I see all their stuff on Facebook. So it's kind of fun to keep up with everybody. Um, I do think you have to be careful about the legal stuff and everything. And and uh, I've been really careful about what I put on Facebook and everything that I put on there is usually a link to something else mm -hmm. or it's a behind the scenes, you know, production still or it's, you know, photos of friends at a party or something where I'm not really worried about them using it in an ad or something like that. But I mean, the, the terms and conditions do say that they can do all sorts of stuff with your photos. So I do think you have to be mindful of that. And if it's just for fun, I think that's great. But um, these, these companies have, uh, bigger fish to fry, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I hate to be that way, but I, you know, I just um 
I don't know. That's just me personally. So, Scott, talk to me a little bit about the choice of you know the black and white filter. You know, a lot of, and a lot of criticism of iPhone photography, iPhoneography, is that what we're calling it nowadays? iPhoneography is that the art filters have kind of a deceptive effect. They can make almost anything look more attractive than it than it really is. So, are we really enjoying the filter, or are we enjoying? The photography, but you know, a lot of your stuff is predominantly black and white. Why? Mm-hmm. Why is that the case? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it, it is. It, it looks better, definitely. You know, like out, out of my, you know, six thousand dollar camera, you know, I'll take a photo in color, convert to black and white. I have to do, you know, some toning, maybe up the contrast or open up the shadows a little bit. It's amazing. The iPhone. Pretty much everything I share with the iPhone, I don't tone at all. That's exactly how it comes out of the camera. You know, so I'll be shoot, I shoot hipstamatic, and I, I don't use many different uh, lenses or, or, or films. I use the Jonas lens, and I use um, something called um, uh, Black Keys, um, black and white. That's what most of my black and whites on. And then I, I kind of haven't really found a color one I really like a lot. Um, and uh, I do a neighborhood watch also where I'm doing iPhone photography essays on every neighborhood in Chicago and that I've pretty much done all in color and uh, you know that's a kind of that's because I started it in color and I now I've kind of just continued it and I think the color looks great too and so but I just think street photography especially especially like in Chicago in the loop and gritty places the black and white just you know gets right to the content immediately you don't get distracted by a red shirt sorry chip like one but you know you don't you know <laughs> You don't, you don't get, you know, I think you can go right to what I'm trying to say is I, I like, you know, I'm trying to say something about just the human condition or, or people. I love just looking at people and, you know, and, and, and I try, I, I kind of work on that a, the edge of making fun of them. I'm not trying to make fun of them. I'm just trying to observe, you know, and I think some of the ones I took here in San Antonio are, are bordering on making fun of people. You're definitely right. making fun of the guy in front of the Alamo. Yeah, well, yeah, well, when you see a guy... <laughs> You know, like a, an older white guy with his pants down by his thighs. I'm just like, you just you can't pass that up, you know. Yeah, you, you Let's know. find it. Yeah, this guy here. Yeah, that one. It's just like, you know, and I think I put on Instagram, I said, you know, these young kids these days, you know, with their, you know, low slung pants. You know, just, <laughs> right. You know, so just, there, there's some things I just can't pass up that I just find too humorous. And, you know, but it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I definitely really like the black and white a lot, and, it, and you, I'm definitely manipulated by the vignetting, and, you know, it, 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 it is, you know, if I would have taken that same photo without that massive vignetting in the black and white, it wouldn't be as effective, I don't think. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I also did, you know, a comparison of, I, I, I did a horse uh, racing track, and I took a photo with the iPhone, and I took another one with my, my Mark IV, and I made a square crop on the Mark IV and didn't tone it at all. And you couldn't tell the difference except for the, you know, the iPhone one was a little less sharp, you know. And so I don't really think I'm distorting reality that much. You know, that's like the big criticism that, oh, this isn't real. You know, you're yeah. kind of, you know, you know, there's nothing, no deception there. I'm not doing anything where I'm trying to, you know, fool someone. It's, it's just, it's just my artistic choice is to shoot it this way. And, you know, I don't think, I, you know, this will go away soon, and then they'll find something else that's just a horrible injustice. And then, you, know, you know, so, you know, it's like this has replaced the lens baby or whatever, you know, in, right. in the pantheon of cardinal sins of photography, so I don't get to worry about it. So, technique question really fast. Do you use, let me, let me put myself on, do you use the old virtual shutter button, or are you side-triggering when you're taking these photos? No, I'm, I like to do everything the long way. You know, I never take any shortcuts, so it's, it's like cable yeah. Release. So I, I basically, you know, my, my, my thing is I have I have you know, oops, where am I here? You know, I just have it like that, and I got the big yellow button there. You yeah. know, and so I just walk around, you know, and basically I stand in front of someone and just, you know, you know, and so it just you know you know, you know and so I I've been shooting from the hip for years, you know, with just my regular camera, so I think I'm getting really good at being able to control how I'm composing things. You know, I can kind of just tilt it up that you know, fraction of an inch just to kind of get what I want in it. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, I've been getting pretty good at that. So it's just kind of, it, it's, it just becomes almost, you know, there's no thought in it anymore. You know, sometimes I'll, 
you know, I'll accidentally hit the screen and something else will come up and I'll just keep pushing, you know, and then all of a sudden nothing <laughs> will be on there. Yeah, so it, it's just, you know, like anything else, I've practiced it and I've done it so much, it's second nature now. Alan, you didn't uh, ask me what I'm using, but I'm using the pocket lint filter on my lens, and uh, I find that it diffuses everything, gives kind of a Sarah, Sarah Moon look, and especially blue jeans that have been washed several times. If right. you keep your iPhone in there, it works really well. You're not um, putting the old uh, Vaseline on the lens there? Yeah, absolutely. The pocket <laughs> lint is great. Um, one of the funny things about it, though, is just the, you know, the fact that everyone's got a camera now is, is interesting to me. And just the, there's some wonderful work being created. I don't discount that. I love what he's doing, and, and I love what Brad's doing. Um, but just the general mundaneness that you get hit with every day, and I think it's just being bombarded with so many pictures from so many people um, leaves me sometimes just going, gosh, does, does everybody take pictures constantly? Right. And uh, one, one of the funny things that I saw was um, I was on a rental car bus the other day, and there was a woman who – okay, the bus was crowded, we were all standing, and there was just tons of people and tons of luggage. And with one hand, you know, wrapped around the pole like this, and the other hand up like this shooting a picture, um, she, she shot a picture just up in the air of the crowded rental car bus. And then I actually watched, I watched her with one thumb sit there and open the picture in, like, three different programs, and she, like, Photoshopped the picture, and she, like, applied a filter, and she converted it to black <laughs> and white, and she wrote a caption... And it went on and on and on and on for, like, 15 minutes, the entire rental car bus ride, and all to, like, send a picture to her Facebook friend saying, oh, the rental car bus is crowded, ugh, you know, or something like that. <laughs> and, and it's just that general mundaneness, everyone sharing every single experience of their life that sort of gets me down sometimes. It's like, it's like a little too much sometimes. But do you, do you think that that, because now everybody is literally a photographer and everyone is capturing these mundane things, that people have a better appreciation of what good photography is? Or do you think it's like, oh, whatever? I do. You know, I don't know. I hope so, but I'm, I'm not so sure. I think, I think uh, everyone takes pretty good pictures at this point, and there's lots of things that they can do. Um, I, don't, I don't know. How do you feel about it, Scott? What do you think? Yeah, I just think people still who aren't visually literate, they, or maybe that's too strong of a word, but... Uh, I, still don't think, I, don't, yeah, I, don't, I don't think they know what to take a picture of, you know, it's just like, yeah. I think that's the key. It's like, you know, they're not, they don't take the time to maybe, you know, take that extra step this way or get a little bit lower or to move across the street. You know, they just kind of use that, you know, zoom in their head where they, oh, I see that little teeny thing that looks interesting and then they'll take a picture and then, you know, later they'll realize it's really small. But I think this proliferation of all the, these images, I do agree it gets a little bit, um, overwhelming because I, you know, I go through my Instagram feed and, you know, 80% of the photos are extremely boring, you know, yeah, and they're yeah. photos of, you know, coffee cups or dogs or, you know, puddles, you know, so it's just not great work, but, but I think that in general, when people now see really good photography, I think it, it, it I believe it makes more of a statement or an impact, you know, than before because I think maybe if they're taking, I think like you said, Alan, if they're you know, if they compare it to their own photography or, or I think ours, you know, as the professional, you know, our work stands out, you know, more. And I, I think it, you know, it's still, it, it's still, you know, the whole question about just monetizing that difference. So it's like, is it worth right. the money for people to, to spend to, to make photography, you know, maybe 50% better, you know, it, it's just like, you know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, most people, I think, just make do with what they have. They'll make do with Uncle Charlie, you know, instead of, you know, paying an extra couple grand for a professional for a wedding or something. So that's, I think that's the problem is, you know, they appreciate it, but they're not, they're still not willing to pay for it. Uh, you are listening to Photo Shelter Happy Hour Live. We're going to switch gears for a second and talk to uh, Robert Seal. He's a Houston-based portrait and corporate and all kinds of sports goodness photographer. Um, I was very, <laughs> I was very upset to see that the New York Knicks, which is my hometown, but not my team, because I'm a New Jersey Nets fan, but that the New York Knicks didn't end up getting Jeremy Lin. Uh, we had such a great run with Lin Sanity, but Houston, in the tradition of Yao Ming and hopefully a, a, a line of great Asian players that will enter the NBA in the, in the next generation. Uh, picked up Jeremy Lin, and you got a call from Sports Illustrated to do a little uh, portrait series with him. 
Yeah, I'm sh- I'm sure that uh, everyone else was at the Olympics. That's why I got the call. But uh, <laughs> the uh, it was literally the next day it was going to happen, and they were doing a press conference and that sort of thing. And uh, oh, there it is now. And um, I was actually due to be at Rich Clarkson's uh, sports workshop uh, teaching out there this year. And uh, so I had to move that back a day and go ahead and schedule this. But it, it literally, you know, in about 12 hours, we, we got a call and we're doing that. So, um, you know, put together a shoot and, and called my buddies that uh, work at the Rockets and stuff. And, and uh, Bill Baptiste was very helpful, who's the Rockets photographer. And, and we just put it together and tried to give them as many looks as we could in, in the short time that we had. When, when we did a, uh, a workshop with you in Austin, uh, you and I kind of walked through and you did a lot of sketching of lighting setups and, and whatnot. Is that kind of the standard procedure when you walk into a situation, particularly when it's you know, a high-profile person who's not going to have a whole lot of time? Yeah. You know exactly the shots you want? Yeah, it's funny because uh, Joey Terrell and I talked about this last week. He was at Clarkson's workshop and he, he does a lot of great work for SI and for Golf Digest and other, other people. And uh, we both said that, you know, we'll walk into a room and we'll just get quiet and start looking around and, you know, the people that are with you or whether it's an assistant or a PR guy or whoever, they're kind of like, hey, is everything okay? Are you, are you guys all right? What's, what's going on? And we're like, no, 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 we're just thinking. <laughs> and, and so you're literally looking around the room going, okay, I can make something out. That's a clean wall. It doesn't have any artwork on it. I can use that. That's a, you know, floor. I can use that. That's got a window. I can use that. And, and you just kind of scope out the joint and try to figure out uh, where you can do it every, everything without moving your lights very much and, um, you know, move the player as little as possible and that sort of thing. So you kind of map it out in your head ahead of time. Um, was was Jeremy pretty cool about the whole thing? He was fine. He was just dead tired. I mean, he, he uh, had been, just been through the ringer. I think he had no sleep. He'd gotten into town the night before and had dinner with uh, one of the other Rockets. And... Um, you know, the Four Seasons Hotel is right across the street from the Toyota Center. That's where he was staying. And, you know, there were people camped out trying to take pictures of him, just like he was, you know, a rock band returning to town or whatever. And so he was uh, – and, you know, they they shuttle these guys around from interview to interview and press conference. And I'm sure he's met with, you know, a bunch of people with the team. And he's done, you know, done recorded PSAs that say, hey, buy Houston Rockets season tickets and everything right. else. and. So yeah, you're you're one of several people getting him for 10, 12 minutes, and and uh, he's pretty worn out. But but he was very nice and and uh, seemed seemed like a good guy. You uh, were uh, shooting for the Sporting News for for many years. You've been freelancing for many years. You've shot a ton of high profile athletes. Who was like the coolest dude you ever shot? Oh man, there's been a bunch of them that that I've really liked. Um, I'm just trying to think here. You know, I, I uh, say what you will, I really enjoyed Roger Clemens, and I shot him probably uh, three or four times, and he was just wonderful to work with. He was great. Mm-hmm. Um, we spent an afternoon in a parking lot one time with him in an old uniform, and he sat out there and showed me how to scuff a baseball and just all sorts of stuff. I mean, it was, it was really uh, kind of one-on-one, and we had a good time. It was, it was really uh, great. Um, but there's been a lot of good ones. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else is. Uh, Tory Hunter is one of the nicest people you'll you'll ever meet. Uh, apologized for being you know 30 seconds or a minute late because he was at church and stuff like that. I mean, you just you get guys that are the typical star athlete that that just treat you really poorly, and then you get guys like that that are just classy as they can be. Um, ever shoot any Olympians? Yeah, I've shot several. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to do any this this season. Uh, <laughs> I, I saw a United ad campaign I wish I had done, uh, and some Time Magazine covers that uh, somebody did that were great, but uh, but not this time. Um, but, yeah, I've shot a lot over the years. I've shot uh, uh, Steven Lopez several times. He's a Olympic taekwondo guy. I guess he'll be going for his third or fourth gold medal this time. And... Um, Laura Wilkinson, who's a, a diver, and um, gosh, I've shot gymnasts, and um, I shot a BMX guy last year. I've shot a whole bunch of different ones. So, yeah, it's, it's always fun to shoot Olympians. Uh, so I don't want to poo-poo individuals because I don't think that that's really, you know, that's not cool. That's not her place. But 
all of I don't you let guys you saying the word poo poo at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you guys saw the those those kind of crazy terrible Olympic portraits. Right. Um, and there were a lot of explanations about what happened. You know the the speed at which people were coming in. He was asked to do kind of a, a lit scenario, and he 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 hadn't used lights before. I wasn't really familiar with it. Um, you know there was blame put on the editors for letting that run across the wire. What the hell do you think happened? And what do you think of those? And now they're spinning it as as if it's like some deep philosophical statement about you know raw athletes and this is how they really look. Like what the hell? That that one blew me away. The fact that uh, they turned it into an art exhibit and everything else. And I'm sure <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure Joe wishes that would go away at some point. Um, I felt bad for the guy. I I don't know him personally, but I I just I've been in that situation. I've done media day stuff at uh, spring training where there's literally 30 to 35 stations, and and people don't realize it, but the just at baseball, you know, spring training, there's about 35 spots, or there used to be when there were more card companies, and uh, you know they they shoot a mugshot for the AP, they shoot one for Reuters, they shoot one for Tops, they shoot one for Upper Deck, they shoot one for SI, Sporting News, ESPN, and it goes on and on and on, Getty. And um, I'm sure at the Olympics it's even worse. And I know they rent out a hotel in Dallas and they give everybody a you know 12 by 12 stall or something to do these in. Um, I, that said, I've seen really fabulous work done there too. And maybe he was in over his head, but but I felt bad for him because I've been in that situation too, where it was really really tough to make a good picture, and the athletes are worn out, and yeah, um, you have no place to use props or to get a low angle or to you know use any kind of environment or anything, and you just have to create something out of nothing. And I think if if I had to do that kind of situation, uh, the thing to do is just to keep it really simple. And I might have just gone in really tight and just done some really nicely lit portraits, you know, just faces or something. And, yeah. and uh, when, you, when you've when you got a limited spot like that in such a small space, trying to do full-length photos with people doing their sport and stuff is just not going to work. And um, that that may be what, what happened there. But I, I, uh, I felt bad for him. I, I, you know, saw everyone on the Internet just blasting this poor guy and, and – um, I just thought, gosh, you, you know, you you guys haven't been in this situation where you've had one minute or two minutes with an athlete, and it's it's tougher than you think, you know. I know last year at the media day for the Yankees, that's that's actually how a series of iPhone portraits with the Yankees shot in the men's bathroom ended up coming across the wire because that I can't remember who the photographer was, but he said, you know, this was the space I was given. I yeah. had really no height or room to set up lights, so I used my iPhone and and Getty went with it. That was kind of amazing, and I thought that was a really smart thing to do. It's it's uh, whether it's iPhone or not, that doesn't matter to me. But but the fact that he just went in tight and did simple portraits and simple yeah. faces and stuff is probably the way to handle that. Um, I've done them before where I've cropped out. You know, we've been outside, just outside of the building, and I've cropped out my little section of sky. Like, okay, I'm going to shoot a, a a blue sky behind the guy here or whatever, or a backdrop over here. And uh, it's really tough when you're working around that many other photographers and, and trying to, they're just cranking them through there like a meat grinder. So it, it is tough on the athlete and the photographers. Scott, did you see those photos and, and what did you think? Yeah, yeah, they, they gave me hives. Because, uh, but I would, have tried to shoot it, <laughs> I would have probably would have tried to shoot it available light, so I wouldn't have done much better. You know, it's just like, I, you know, I have, a, I have a strobe somewhere, but I don't know where my AA batteries are, so it probably doesn't work. <laughs> so, but. <laughs> but no, I, I really admire Robert and his work, and, and anyone who can do portraiture because it's it's definitely not my strength. You know, my portrait setup is a fifty-one-two, and I just that's what I use for like every single portrait I do. And, and <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't get many portrait assignments at the Tribune. So, but, so I speaking of the Olympics, I love the Olympics, and I can't stop watching the. Olympics. I'm just uh, I'm getting this in my ear here, Alan. Sorry, I've got a I've got a producer texting me. Uh, Cy Sear, who says that Nick Layham was the bathroom photographer, so ah. just for, for the record. <laughs> All right, I like that, I like that. So somebody's watching. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Scott, you had a blog entry maybe a week or two ago with some of your favorite Olympic shots, mm -hmm. and I hadn't realized it, but the one that you have of Michael Phelps throwing up the bouquet to his mom, which was one of my favorites from the Olympics, I didn't realize you had shot that one. 
Oh, yay. I was like, oh, uh, Scott put together, like, you know, a collection of his favorite images, and <laughs> there it was. Um, tell us about what it's like to shoot in Olympics. Oh, it, it's, it's the most amazing, tiring, crazy thing you can do. It's, you know, it's basically three weeks of 20-hour days, and you just, especially the Summer Olympics, you just go from event to event to event. And now, especially with having to transmit photos, like in Beijing, they were doing the finals of the swimming, like right on our deadline at, at the office. So I was trying to transmit photos between the end of Michael Phelps's race and the award ceremony, and then you know stop and shoot pictures, and then transmit some more. But but still, you know the Olympics is amazing. You know the light is beautiful, the backgrounds are great. You know there's amazing photo positions. Uh, it. it you know, it, it's so amazing that by the end of the Olympics, you're, like, sick of taking great photos. You're like, ah, oh, if I have to take one more of these amazing jubilation photos, you know, I'm going to throw up. You know, it's just like it just gets to be so much good stuff that it almost gets to be too much. But it, it's it's an amazing experience. And I, 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 I really am, you know, a little bit sad that I didn't get to go to London. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it, I've, I, I got to go to three games. I shot in Athens and Beijing and Torino for the Winter Olympics. And I think the Winter Olympics is actually – a lot more physically demanding than the summer games because you're you're fighting the weather and the cold and you know going through the snow and you're in the mountains so you know but it it it's been you know ever since I was a young photographer it, I know shooting the Olympics has always been a dream of mine and and being able to shoot three of them has been great and um, Beijing I shot you know kind of you know as as a lone guy for the Tribune and uh, you know so I was working working really hard at it but it, but it you know it, it's an amazing experience, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I love, you know, I've been looking at all the Olympic photos I can, and, uh, you know, it, it, there's, you know, some great work being done now. The only, the only thing about the Olympics, though, is that, like, the photos tend to start getting really repetitive, you know. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of, you almost, because, you know, you don't have a lot of choice of where you can be, you kind of start to have to use your bag of tricks, you know, your blur and your, your, your you know, your silhouette or, you know, get really tired or, you know, so it's, you know, I really like when I see someone who does something different, like you know, when David Burnett did his medium format or, or large format stuff, or you know, Adam Pretty, I think, is an amazing photographer. Um, you know, just when, when people try to do something different, you know, I would love to be able to shoot an Olympics someday, not for anyone, just for myself, because you could get some great stuff, but you know, if you don't have that kind of feeding the beast demand of, of shooting the winners, and the, you know, if you can just kind of shoot the edges, an Olympics is really kind of, it's like Disney World, you know, you know, built usually in kind of a really bad part of town, you know, and so when you kind of get on those edges by the, you know, the cyclone fences and, you know, the dirt and stuff, it, it, there's a really weird kind of, um, you know, vast difference between, you know, the Olympics and, and what's outside the Olympics. So I would love to someday just explore that boundary between the Olympics and where real life starts again because it's kind of fascinating. I don't know how I got off on that tangent, but... I saw a bunch of articles, um, I guess both AP and Reuters put a lot of money into these robotic cameras this year and seeing some, uh, you know, the, the overhead images from like the long jump pit where, you know, on the landing, they, they look so cool to me. Um, yeah. what, have, have you seen those images and, and, and what's your take on using the technology and, you know, essentially doing radio triggered photography? Yeah, I, I think it's all valid. You know, it's, it doesn't. You know, to me, it's like whatever you can do to to make a great photo, go ahead and do it. Um, you know, I've always been in awe of the underwater photography. You know, it's just like I think every photo ever taken underwater is amazing. You know, it doesn't even matter what it is. There's something about being underwater <laughs> that's just, just great. Um, but yeah, if you can get a camera in places that it's never been before, you know, that's that's great. You know, I would love to be able to you know at the NFL games to stick a camera up on that little overhead camera that goes over the field because yeah. I really love that directly straight overhead view. It's just something you never see and no one no one gets to see. So if you can offer that to people, a view that they can't see themselves, that's that, that's great. Seal, have you shot uh, an Olympics before? I haven't, no. Um, I just barely missed one, actually. the uh, When I went to work for the Sporting News in 96, uh, they had done every Olympics, you know, for the past several before that, I mean, since they started covering all the sports. Um, originally it was just a baseball publication, but, um, you know, the writers I worked with all said, you know, hey, we used to cover the Olympics and we used to do Wimbledon, we used to do the Tour de France and everything. 
And as soon as I got there, we had a bunch of consultants that got a hold of the Sporting News. We were owned by uh, Times Mirror then that, that uh, also owned the L.A. Times and the Hartford Current, a bunch of other papers. And we had a consultant that came in and said, the Sporting News is for hardcore sports fans. It's uh, football, baseball, basketball only. And that's all we're going to do, or hockey also. That's all we're going to do. We're not going to do the Olympics anymore. It's a waste of money. We want the hardcore sports fan who wants his football news while the Olympic, while all his, you know, his girlfriend or his wife is watching the Olympics. We want that. You know? <laughs> and so that's what I got hit with in 96 as soon as I went there. And we actually had credentials sitting on our editor's desk like that we, you know, we were already approved and stuff. And then they decided they weren't going to send us. And I was out shooting football training camp during the Atlanta Olympics or something. <laughs> so. Wow. I just just missed it. My wife uh, Karen got to shoot the Atlanta Olympics, so and and uh, you know everybody I know pretty much has been several times. Uh, like uh, friend Smiley Poole from the Chronicle, he's there right yeah. now. So, um, um, so we, we we said we would touch upon this a little bit. So I want to carve out a little bit of time. There was a bit of a, 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 a to do maybe about a month ago when it was announced that the USA Today photographers who have shot multitudes of Olympics. A lot of friends of ours, Bob Deutsch and uh, Jack Gruber and Bob Hanashiro and Eileen Glass and all those 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 folk weren't going to go to the Olympics because U.S. Press Wire, which was acquired by Gannett, the parent company, would be going. A lot of head scratching around that, and and for me it wasn't you know there's obviously a lot of controversy about U.S. Press Wire and what they're doing to the sports photography industry. What I didn't understand is that. Uh, people who are on salary, that's a sunk cost already. I couldn't understand if they're already on salary and that budget was allocated, why weren't they just being sent to go shoot? Whereas I assume the U.S. press wire guys are all freelance and you'd have to carve out a budget specifically for them to go. But I don't understand newspapers at all. So, you know, what, what, what's your take on, on that? Uh, and I should point out, in the end, there are USA Today photographers there. But what's your take on the situation with the U.S. Press Wire and the Olympics and all of these major sporting events and, and, and what's happening with the way that staffers are being used at, uh, at these, at these uh, papers and magazines? You want to go first, Scott, or me? No, I'll, I'll, I'll just go real quickly. Um, you know, I, for, I think being a, a photographer, you know, the tradition or the history of, of things is that newspapers would always use freelancers, but it would always be for the stuff that the staffers couldn't get to or maybe they didn't want to waste the staffers' time on. But now if it gets to a point where the freelancers get all the great stuff and the staffers have to kind of shoot the daily stuff, you know, I think that's what kind of bugs people because it's such a major perk to go to an Olympics and to all of a sudden have that farmed out, you know, that's just like a punch in the gut. But, but, you know, I think, Alan, I think what it is is I, I assume that you kind of, when you contract with U.S. Press Wire, you just pay X amount of money a month, and so it doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to pay for hotel rooms or you don't have to pay for airfare. You're just getting their feed of photography. And, and, but Gannett owns U.S. Press Wire, so, right. you, know, I don't, you know, I don't really know how their financials are. But, you know, at the Tribune, we use US, U.S. Press Wire, and we've used them for the Olympics, and, you know, it's, you know, it's, I, you know, financially, how can you argue with it? They're, they're supplying you, you know, the Olympics, you, you, there's not that big of a difference between, you know, a seasoned photographer, maybe someone who's not quite qualified because, you know, it's pretty much set up to make great photos. Right. So I, I can't really argue with the financial part of it. You know, if you're going to get, you know, almost the same quality of photos for much less, you know, it's kind of hard to argue with that because it's all about supply and demand, you know, and that's what makes U.S. Press Wire, you know, so, so uh, you know, you know, kind of financially successful is because there's so many people out there who's gonna, who are going to shoot for free just to be on a sideline or for very minimal amount of money who, who have other jobs. You know, there's a lot of great guys in Chicago who shoot for U.S. Press Wire. I like a lot. They're great guys, but they have full-time jobs, you know, and then this is like their hobby. And it's right. kind of like my Instagram thing, which is kind of my hobby. You know, it's not, I don't care if I, you know, monetize it or I don't care if, if someone uses the photo because, you know, I have a full-time job and you know, but I think Robert has some probably better points too. So let's get to him. Go, go, Robert. I'll put these on first. <laughs> um, so <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I have a big problem with this. I I used to work on a staff of four staff photographers at the Sporting News, and I left in '06 before all this really hit. 
Um, but the reason my friends don't have jobs now is because there's a virtually free U.S. press wire feed going to the sporting news. And the reason that USA Today staffers' jobs are in danger is because there's a virtually free U.S. press wire feed going to them. Of course, they bought the company now, so it's different. But, but initially, that's the way it worked. And so what's happened is photographers around the country have been sold a bill of goods. And it originally happened to professionals. People uh, in charge of that company went around and said, hey, so-and-so, you just got laid off from um, X newspaper or whatever. How would you like to come shoot for our agency? And they would shoot for them, and the contract said that they owned their pictures and that they were going to get a cut and all this sort of thing. And without a doubt, and I can count you know, probably 50 people off the top of my head, have worked for them uh, for a period of time, said, where's the money, what's going on? And basically the answer is uh, the service was given away for a long period of time to get newspapers and, and people on the hook and get them interested in it and build that business. And as those guys died off, college students came in, uh, you know, there's enough websites where you can troll for people in different cities and, and find people to work for you. Um, you know, somebody contacted me when I was 19 years old and a college student that had halfway decent pictures and said, hey, do you want to go to the Kentucky Derby? I probably would have done it too. So I'm not, I'm not discounting that. Um, but, you know, four SI staffers were just laid off last week, and you see the proliferation of that, you know, their photography in Sports Illustrated. You see it in the sporting news. You see it in ESPN. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where if you, you know, put a thousand monkeys on typewriters in a library, as soon, sooner or later they're going to come up with the works of Shakespeare. It's, it's not as difficult as it used to be. There's no manual focus going on or exposure or any of that. All the skills that made um, some of the greats, you know, really good sports photographers aren't really necessary anymore, and some of these people are eventually going to come across a good picture. And if you throw a whole bevy of them at something, it's going to happen. Uh, and there's actually some really good photographers in there, too, that are hobbyists or that are uh, part-timers or whatever. So I'm not discounting that they do have some good people there. I just think it's unethical to uh, promise people something and, you know, never deliver. And then basically when the big money comes, when Gannett comes knocking or you came knocking to Gannett and sold the service to them, um, you know, no one's really seeing any of it. And they're basically, it's, it's like rock and roll fantasy camp. They're getting an experience out of the deal, um, but they're not going to see any money and they're not going to be able to buy two EOS 1DXs or two D4s and, and the long lenses that they need to do their job and run a viable business. It's just not going to happen. And the problem is there's, a, there's an unending supply of these people that want to do this, that think it's cool and think it's fun and are willing to finance it themselves. And that's what I didn't count on. It was somebody running a business that's based on free labor. And, and uh, it's brilliant when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, so I have a big problem with it. I, I see my, my old profession, and, and uh, I see all my friends losing their jobs. And it's, there's, uh, the people that run that company are, are directly responsible for a lot of it. And, and one of them used to work at SI, and, and um, right. you know, it's, it's bad. If, if I worked there with him, um, I wouldn't be happy. I, I guess that was my issue, too. I mean, I, I, I don't have as a discerning eye as you guys, but I don't see a whole lot of difference between the quality of the images that I'm seeing from U.S. Press Wire. It seems like they have enough competent people shooting these sports. The disappointment for me as an entrepreneur, as an internet entrepreneur, you know, every employee that we hire at Photo Shelter gets equity in the company because we want every single employee to gain upside if we're successful because everybody's putting their time in. So for me, the disappointment with the U.S. Press Wire was, like you said, the people who came on early or even the people who came on late never had an opportunity to gain upside from the sacrifices that they were making. And in a lot of cases, they weren't even paid for the work that they did in the first place. It's, it's called taking advantage of people, and that's, that's basically what's going on. But the problem is there's people that are willing to be taken advantage of. They're out there. And it's the reason that I've shot two games in the past year and a half, you know. So it's just um, as long as there's people willing to do it. And some people see it as marketing to get to the next level. They think if I just do this for U.S. Press Wire for a while, my photos are really good, SI is going to see them, and they're going to hire me. Well, guess what? 
in the meantime, you've just made sure that there's no more jobs at SI and that there never will be because they're having to lay people off and everything else. So, so I just, you know, um, people have, you know, jeopardized their own future, or their their own goals, I guess, by working for them. It's a, it's a huge uh, catch twenty two. You know, you can you can work for them and be the best photographer in the world, but there's no future for you to work for. You're going to have to go into another business of photography if you want to make money. Scott, do you think you're going to be able to retire as a staff photographer, or do you think the position gets eliminated at some point and you go freelance? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, you know, I always joke that I want to be the last newspaper photographer in the world, you know, like I'm going to go down <laughs> with the ship, you know. No, my wife is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it, it, you know, there's, you know, I have a wife, and you know, we each have two kids from previous marriages, you know. So I enjoy the benefits, and I enjoy having salaried position. Um, you know, there are some things that, from the outside, look, you know, appealing to freelancers. You know, being a freelancer, I know it's not as appealing probably as it looks. You know, so I, I kind of am happy to have my staff job. Um, but you know, I, I think. You know, the Tribune, you know, Chicago Tribune and Tribune Company, you know, we're just coming out of bankruptcy. We don't know who's going to own us. We don't know what they're going to do with us once they own us. You know, it's just, it's all still up in the air. And, you know, I, I, I still think that there's enough of need, you know, like in Chicago. You know, the Chicago Tribune brand is really strong, and it's something that readers really kind of respect. And uh, the people, you know, it's a civic institution. And so I think it, it's got some shelf life left. And... Uh, you know, so I, you know, I would, you know, I would love if I can get ten more years at a newspaper. That would be, you know, I think that'd be great. But, you know, I, I, I'll just kind of, you know, see what happens and then wing it. And if not, I'll, you know, I'll come work for Photo Shelter, get some of that equity. In. <laughs> 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 Me too, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Seal, uh, now that you're not, you're not shooting games, how, why do you think you've been successful as a freelancer? Is it because you uh, changed the focus of the things that you're doing? Because I didn't count on sports, and that yeah. was the, the biggest takeaway from all of this was when I, when I left my staff job at the Sporting News, I really thought 25 30% of my business would still be sports. And, um, you know, someone, someone very wise said, don't put all your eggs in this basket, you know, um, don't quit if I'm your only client kind of thing. And uh, so I went out and got other clients and other businesses. And being diverse, I think, is the, the best thing you can do is shoot lots of different things. It, it's really hard to market yourself that way because every marketing consultant that's out there with, with all the different services says, uh, tell everybody you're a food photographer. Tell everybody you're a sports portrait photographer. Tell everybody you're, you know, whatever you are. And, um, you know, that you should have this single-minded message. But a single-minded message works well for marketing. It doesn't work well for keeping your business afloat and all yeah. the different things you're going to run into. So it's, it's sort of counterintuitive and weird. Um, but, yeah, I, I think, and I don't know how successful I am. I'm, I'm still in business. But, but it's, uh, it's one of these things where I, I try to diversify and do lots of different kinds of jobs. And uh, there's stuff we do for annual reports. There's stuff that's industrial or corporate type photography. There's portraiture for magazines that aren't just sports, that are business magazines and other things like that, general interest magazines. So I think, I think just diversifying and trying to do different things is great. And then try to take on some personal projects that fulfill you, you know, just like um, Scott likes to do the iPhone stuff. I've been taking portraits of pilots and, and um, guys that I admire and that I wanted to meet and photograph and, and that's been a big part of what I've been trying to do. And, and um, you know, who knows, maybe you can do something with that, you know. And so what percentage of the business is sports photography related at this point? 10%? 5%? Maybe, maybe 10. I mean, are you talking financial or time yeah, or what? Just financial revenue. Yeah, less than 10. Yeah, amazing. Well, listen, guys, this has been fun and informative. Thank you so much for hanging out. I should point out that... Uh, Robert Seal will be uh, leading a workshop at our Luminance conference uh, in September. You can find out more about that at photoshelter.com slash luminance and his wonderful blog, robertsealblog.com. Thank you, Robert. And we're going to, uh, the, the whole workshop is going to consist of us shooting pictures with the iPhone with the lamp filter. That's, that's kind of <laughs> what I'm going to work on. And Scott Strazanti from the Chicago Tribune. You can follow him on Instagram at Scott Strazanti, as well as what's the uh, what's the uh, Chicago Tribune URL there? Oh gosh, it's way too long. But uh, just uh, Google my name and shooting from the hip. 
you know, that's sure. probably, or just my name, just Google my name, you'll find it, Shooting from the Hip blog is, you know, a long newspaper type of link that <laughs> I don't even know what it is. Thanks, guys, for, uh, for joining us today. It was really, really fun. All right, man. Take care. Thanks to the audience. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.